go. I'm, I'm with Ron Thompson for, for our second talk. Um, Ron, Ron, to my mind, is one of the most knowledgeable wildlife experts I know of, and uh, certainly commands all my respect in that he is prepared to say what needs to be said without worrying about um, who he upsets or what uh, whatever he sets in, in motion. Uh, and if only the more people would listen to people like Ron, we might have a, a chance of solving some of these problems. But that is uh, that's another story. What I want to do, Ron, is uh, I want to I want you to take us back to the to your early days in the game department um, as a ranger and uh, and tasked with problem animal control. So that would have involved shooting elephant, lion, um, a whole host of animals where they're interfering with human human population. So just um, you mentioned man eaters a bit a bit earlier in, in the last talk. Uh, tell us about some of the man-eaters that you went after. Okay. Um, I must tell you that from the outset that that I, I, I really I really enjoyed my hunting. It was it was part of my life. It was part of what made me um, part of what what made me join national parks and become a game ranger. And after after the polish had gone off the hunting, although it really hasn't gone off at all. Um, once I had satisfied um, what I needed to satisfy in terms of my need to hunt, um, I then found that my job itself became of greater importance than the actual hunting. And I'm actually getting in my old age now, I'm getting a lot more satisfaction in telling people about wildlife management issues than I am telling them about hunting. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. um, I have written all my big game hunting memoirs down in, in seven volumes. And um, they're all in... Um, um, limited edition books, only a thousand copies of each were printed, they're beautifully printed, and they, they are available, I've still got most of them available, not the first one, unfortunately, but you can read all of the books, if people who want to read them and read these stories, all, my, all the prime hunting stories are in a, a series of books that I have under my name, Ron Thompson Books, in, on Kindle, on the e, in the ebook. Okay. Section. Okay. Okay. Um, and they're, they're all wrapped up with here and there with, with wildlife management issues. So um, I could never get away with that. But OK, fine. Um, my, my, my first exciting hunt was actually with, uh, with the point two to Hornet. And when I shot my first leopard, and that was on the Angwa. Um, and uh, after that, when I joined the UK Atomic Energy Authority in the, in the um, Toko area. I shot another six uh, leopard there, and uh, and then an, ele an elephant. A very in in elegant hunt, I must say, the elephant hunt. Um, I had a, a rifle that was big enough to be able to hunt it, but I wasn't okay with elephant. I didn't know where its brain was. I didn't know what it was going to do when I pulled the trigger. I was petrified, but and and I, and I shot from too far away, and I always. I, I had a little area of rocks that I could get behind so that I could um, get a good leaning shot at it. And it was a shot of about 60 yards. And I aimed for the brain, or, or at least I aimed for where I thought the brain was located. And I pulled the trigger and there were two bulls. And um, both of them just spun around on their back legs and, high, and hightailed. And as, the, as they disappeared, the one I had already hit, I put a bullet in behind the, the, the shoulder and it ran off. And... Uh, Thank goodness they ran away because my heart was beating like hell. And I had a couple of, of my black staff with me at the time. They, they didn't know anything about them either. But we tried to track them. Elephant tracks on and off all over the place. I couldn't track them. I didn't know what, what I was doing. Um, we picked up a few blood spots, which I knew meant that I'd hit it. Um, and I'd hit it somewhere where it was bleeding. But, but then they disappeared. Strax disappeared. We couldn't find them anywhere, and we walked for the for the whole of the rest of that afternoon. We um, we we hunted that elephant down. We we found nothing. We got, got, walked back to camp. The next day, I got I stopped all work, and all the guys went down to to where we'd hit this elephant. About twenty people down there, trying to find tracks. 
I don't think that there's, there's black guys who, who were working for me really wanted to find the elephant because I'd already demonstrated to them that I didn't know what the hell I was doing when I was trying to shoot them. So they didn't want another encounter like that. Anyway, nobody found the tracks. And then we went back again and uh, back to camp. And then I just had to sit there and, and with my head in a sling and uh, worry about what had happened to the elephant that I'd wounded. And I really felt very bad. Um, and then two, three days later, an itinerant um, old black man walked past our camp, came into our camp and asked for water. He'd come from Nyanga and he was going up to Mtoko, which is right through the middle of the African bush. And a single old man on his own, and he was carrying an elephant's tail. So I said to him, where do you get your elephant's tail? He said, oh, there's an elephant over there and it's lying down and it's dead and what have you. So we cut its tail off. He also had a big bunch of, of raw meat with him. So he told us where it was and how to find it. He says, you'll find it quite easy. It's the vultures all over the place. So um, we immediately went straight down to this and we found, we saw the vultures. We found our elephant. It was lying on the side of the Nyagadzi River and it was stone dead and it was bloated. And the vultures have been sitting all over the top of it. They couldn't get into it because the skin was so thick, but they had dropped their droppings, their white droppings all over it. It looked, looked like a Christmas tree. So in order for me to get the photograph I needed to present to national parks, which I intended to do to prove to them that I had hunted an elephant, um, I got these guys I had to run all the way back to camp, which was a, about an hour and a half away, come back again with buckets. They got buckets of water from the river and they came up and they scrubbed my elephant right down, took all the, all the, all the white um, droppings off um, from the whole body and, and then, then we could. All, then the other thing was that it was bloated. Its legs were sticking up in the air, so we couldn't have a photograph like that. So I opened up the stomach, and I, I punctured all the all the all the air in the intestines, and the legs went down, and it looked fairly natural. We then went to another angle where you couldn't see all this, and we photographed it. So that's the story of my first elephant, and it was wasn't a very um, happy experience. But mm. they said everything starts and has small beginnings. So that was the first of many elephants, I know that. But um, tell us about the man-eaters. The first man-eater that I shot was at a place called Salankomo in the Cholocho uh, Forest Reserve, um, right down at the bottom end of the Cholocho district. Um, there were two, two young eight-year-old boys, pickings as always happened with the cattle. It was their job to go and herd the cattle, to take them out in the morning, to go back in the evening and pick them up and bring them back into their crawl in the village. And the, the cattle had strayed off several miles from the village. But these little guys, they're full of guts. And they, they went out on their own with a stick just to drive the cattle back. And on the way back, this big black man lion came, and it was a big black man lion came rushing out from the bush, grabbed one of the pickings, pulled him into the bush and started, um, started eating him. So the other little pickin, he just left the cattle and he took to his heels. He ran home to his dad in the village and he said, listen, oh, Georgie boy, he's just been taken by a lion. So the old man then got all, all the young men in the village and the near, nearby villages, they got spears and they all went out to go and rescue the little boy who by then must have been half eaten by the lion already. But anyway, they, they went out and the other little boy took them and he says, this is where he was taken. And the lion took him into that bush over there and it was still in there with the body of his brother. So these guys say, okay, guys, let's go in and get this lion. Let's go and get, get the little boy's body out. So they all rushed at the, at the lion. The lion came roaring out after them, at them, direct. And everybody turned around and ran away, except the old man with his spear. Well, the, the, the lion made very short shrift of him and then dragged him back to his body, back to where the little boy's body was half eaten. Jeez. And uh, what we discovered, in fact, that they were, there were, there were three other lines there. So there were four lines altogether. <laughs> and uh, when, they went, when they went back, um, one of the other people there sent, sent someone on a bicycle along this about 20, 30 miles away to um, a place called Pelandaba, um, where the DC had a small building and he had a telephone in there. You were able to contact him by phone. So they phoned him up just before dusk and he said, listen, this has happened. They have taken the old man and the little boy, and now the old man. Now, now there are now. Um, they didn't know that there were four. They thought it was still the one line. So he. They then phoned through to Chilocho to his office. They didn't get the word through until the next morning, 
Um, I was in Bulawayo doing something else. I can't remember what, oh, my wife was having her first baby and we had to take her in. It was 300 miles from Bingo. It was a difficult thing having babies there. If you wanted to see the doctor, you had to travel 300 miles. So anyway, she'd had all that done. We stayed with friends and uh, packed everything up. We also, at that, at that time, we got all our groceries from Bulawayo, 300 miles away from Bingo, where I lived. We had all the deep frozen food that we had in special deep frozen packages that we had to, to take back home to Binga because there you, you only once a month you, you, you buy what you need. And um, we called in to see the provincial warden, John Tebbett, who was in his office on the way. Right now we're home, thank you for everything, and uh, we'll be back in a, in a few hours' time to get back to Binga. He says, No, 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 wait a minute. He says, um, I want you to go. He knew that I. My Bushman Trackman was with me. He was my right-hand man. Uh, he was my best friend for over 20 years. Um, and I always carried my rifle with, with me, wherever I went. I always had it because all sorts of things cropped up. So he says, I want you to go to, to um, um, Chocho. Go and see the DC there. There's, someone's been eaten by a lion. I said, well, why can't Wanky handle this? I'd left Wanky then and I'd gone to Binga on the shores of Lake Kariba. I said, it's, it's in their area, not in my area. He says, they haven't got anybody in Wanky who has got the experience to deal with this kind of problem. They don't have that, your experience with the lions. So I said, okay, right, well, let's go. So we had to dump my, my pregnant wife back with friends, get back on the thing, and off we went to Chilocho. When we got there, uh, we were told what it was. He said, this is at Salankomo, and I knew Salankomo from my days in, in Wanky. So we drove to Salankomo, me and my bushman tracker, in our Land Rover, and in my private Land Rover, I, I made camp next to a pool, a, a pan of water, uh, which was quite normal for us, and I set up camp there, and the local people saw us um, decamping, and they said, you, you're going to sleep here, out in the open, in your Land Rover, when there's a man-eating lion running around. I said, yes, why, what's the matter? I said, if the lion comes here, we'll shoot it. So they said, no, 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 we can't allow you to do that. So they came with a, with a scotch cart, and Two oxen pulling it piled high and dry firewood so we could have a big bonfire to keep the lines away. It was really remarkable how they looked after us. So um, anyway, uh, another little boy comes along with his dog and he tied the dog on a leash to the front bumper of the motor car. And at this point, he said, this is a very good little dog. He says, if the lion comes, it will bark and it wake you up. If you're asleep, the lion finds you, it'll catch you too, even if you have a big fire. Anyway, we said thank you for even everybody pushed back to the village. And um, the next morning, um, I got up and uh, we were having coffee and built on whatever it was we had for, for breakfast. And this little boy who brought the dog came up to us. And, and he said, yes, he said, I've come to let my dog go. You don't leave him there all day. He can run back to the village. And then he says, you're going to need someone to show you where all this happened. This is a little kid of eight. So we said, okay, no men, no men from the village, nothing. We never saw hide nor hair of them. So he, he, he walked us for about two, three miles and through this little flay, and he says, the lion's in there. That's where it is. This is where he caught Sansa Sansa. Because he had been there when, when his father was caught also. So I said, okay, fine. So it's in there. You just stay behind me, and I'm going to go in and see what we can do. So um, I went in and uh, walked up to it and I heard the, the lion growling. This is one difference between lions and leopards. If you approach a leopard like this during the day, you do, it's silent, absolutely silent. It doesn't, if, if you come, it doesn't growl. Unless it's caught in a trap, then it's a different thing. But a leopard doesn't growl at you. It hides itself by sound and everything. But a lion doesn't. A lion is very happy to growl at you and tell you to push off. So we heard, we heard this lion growling. So I went in. It, charged at me, came running out. I stood my ground. I didn't run away and I, I let it come and it stopped within about 15 yards of me and it stood glaring at me, growling at me. So I put a bullet in its brain and killed it. So I didn't, I then didn't know that there were, there was more than the one line. And this was a big old black line. When we finally opened it up, we found that it had a cancerous growth in its and it was skin and bone. So it was an old nomad who'd been kicked out of Wanky and it was now trying to find a place to live outside the Wanky boundaries. Anyway, we went up there and we, we saw what remained of, of all the bodies and um, the two bodies. And then we saw the number of tracks around. And my trackers looked at this and said, there's more than one line here. 
there are two or three lines here. So we said, all right, well, we'll go back and get the Land Rover and we'll come here and we'll pick up the dead line. We'll pick up what's left of the bodies and put them in there and take them back to the village. So we got back to, with, with this little boy with us and he was with us all the time. He showed no fear. Um, we got back to where the Land Rover was and um, we were getting ready. Then we heard, we heard shouting and screaming coming from the local village, which was about a mile or so away up the road. So I turned around and jumped in the Land Rover, in and in the back, Ben with my, my, my tracker with my rifle, and we shot to the village. We just got to the village and all the mothers were herding their children together and pushing them into the huts. And the men were standing at the, at the side, shouting the odds. We said, what's the matter? They said, the lions have just been here. They were just gone over there through that gap in the fence. So when I, they said, no, 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 no. So I went off and uh, walked through the plowed field up to the fence. It was just a rough pen, uh, fence or, or bush brush. And um, there we picked up the tracks. We followed them through and they were, they were loping along. And then they, they, they were loping when they were chased by the sound. Then they started walking slowly and, um, and, and, and they were um, one behind the other. And then I saw where one had stopped to urinate and in the dry teak, teak, we went into the teak forest, there were dry leaves like little cups on the ground and they were holding the urine in place like, like, like little saucers. So we could see this was going on. And while we were examining this, the lions went far ahead of us, from now moving slowly. Then I heard cattle away over on one side. The, the local people put brass around their necks when the cattle so if they go out to find their cattle, they can find them by the long, 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 long of the, of the thing on their neck. But the lions also know this trick. When they, they hear gong, 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 they think it's the dinner bell that they're hearing. So the lions heard this, and where we were following them, 50 yards away we were following them, the lions took a, a right-hand angle and went all running flat out now towards the gonging of the bells. And um, it was just a casual gonging. And when they got there, they jumped on one car, we, we took after them and we were running on the track. Um, and the, the tracking was easy in Kalahari sand under the teak forest. When we got there, um, there was a one lion with its, its um, around the throat of a cow and it was strangling it. But another two lions, they were all youngsters, so all about mm, so old maybe at the most. And um, uh, two of them were eating, eating the, the back of, of the animal. Well, it wasn't even dead. the other one was holding it around the throat. So I, I was able to, to, to walk straight up to them within about 10 meters of them. It was a really thick bush. So I had to get that close to be able to, to see them. And I shot the one and it just rolled over and the other two just took off. They didn't wait. And they were we following that day. We, we, they didn't, we, couldn't, we couldn't find them and they just came. So we got two out of the four of those, of those man eating. Uh, so that's one instance of, of man eating lions. Um, the next lot, when I got, funnily enough, when I got back from that exercise, I went back to Bulawak, we went to, to Binga, the DC came around to see me, he says, I want you to go down to, to Mudiri, he said, the lions are eating people down there, the same day that I arrived back, and you, you know, these were the first two incidences of man-eating lions I'd ever had to attend to, so anyway, we went, went down, it was 100 miles further on than Binga, and Ben and I went down there, and we, uh, went and saw the local people right on the edge of Lake Kariba. And uh, what had happened, the, the Batonka, very primitive Iron, Iron Age people, they used to build houses on, on stalks. They used to have poles in the ground, put a platform, and then the hut was on the top of the platform. Then they had a ladder that used to, used to go up from the side, and they climbed the ladder to get in. They used to put a fire underneath their hut every night, and they had no floor. They had just poles, floor in their hut above. And the smoke from the fire used to come up through the through the floor into the hut where they were sleeping and keep the mosquitoes away. So it was their way to protect themselves against malaria. Anyway, these lions had taken to um, climbing up the ladder, getting on the top, opening the door, grabbing somebody out of his bed, pulling him and eating them at the bottom of the ladder. And what I discovered when I got into it was that they had they had been doing this for about six months, and nobody had reported it. But Tonka didn't think it was just a thing to were very primitive people. They thought, well, we've been eaten, we just get eaten, and that's what happens. And for six months, these lions had been going out once or twice a week, killing, eating, moving further along down 
on the British lines. Um, they must have moved about 30 to 40 uh, miles or kilometers from Chetty Game Reserve. And, uh, and then they found a new place where there were new people to eat. We, we went out, I, went, I shot a zebra and I shot an impala and dragged them around the countryside where everybody told me they'd seen the lion tracks and I tied them down and I, um, I laced them with strychnine poison um, for, for man eaters, anything is game to, to get rid of them. Um, but uh, I, I covered them all over with branches to begin with. And then in the evening, I took the branches off and left them exposed. The following morning went round and checked them out. And I found, a, uh, I found that a hyena had come in and eaten and it had died. Now I couldn't, I couldn't leave it there. So I had to have a bonfire of dead wood, get the dead wood and, and burn the hyena so that there was no poison lying around. Covered the things over again. And then I went back to my camp. I got back about midday the next morning. And our camp was a little hut about 10 feet across in diameter with pole walls and a thatched roof, no mud on it, just open pole walls. The DC used to put his drum of petrol in there for his outboard motor when he came up on patrol. And the diesel was in there. So we took the two diesel drums out and we, we put our beds inside. And we put the diesel drums at the front because there was no gate. That's so what the lions come, they've got to get past the drums before they get to us. Anyway, we were sweating like hell. The temperatures there go up to 55 degrees during the day. It was very hot. We then decided, we also were, were covered in blood and what have you from the, the kills that we had made. We took the DC's little boat with a paddle and we went out, out on the lake, which is crystal clear water and it was, it was like, like a mirror. We got about 30 or 40 meters off the, off the, the shore and we jumped overboard. We'd stripped down, jumped overboard and then we got back into the boat and then we washed ourselves down with soap. Then we jumped back in again to clean ourselves and back, back onto the boat. And I was drying myself when a Makoro, um, one of these log canoes, came from a, a place higher up lake and went right past our boat. And there was a guy in there and he had a big bundle of clothes in the Makoro with him. And we discovered that this guy's name was Johnny and his, he, his job was a tailor. So Johnny the tailor went past us. He waved, we waved. We were still getting ourselves clean and he beached the Makoro on the, on the shoreline, right near where our camp was, walked past our hut, walked into the bush, which is, was 50 yards from our hut, went into the bush and that's the last time we saw him. So the next day we went back again, we went out and we checked the baits that evening, we, un we undid all the baits, so that we always covered them so the vultures couldn't find them during the day and um, we uncovered them for that night, we went back to camp, we slept that night in the camp. And um, then we went out the next day looking for what would happen if the lions had come. We didn't get anything at all. We hunted everywhere looking for tracks. We got back to camp about midday. And there was a whole entourage of tribal people sitting there waiting for us to tell us um, that Johnny the tailor hadn't come back. He'd gone out and he had picked up clothes and things from the fishermen in, in a fishing camp higher up. He brought them back. He had a sewing machine and he was going to repair all their torn clothes. That was what was in the bundle. That was in the Makoro. That was what he carried over his shoulder into the bush. And, and we were all sitting around out in the open. So we said, well, let's go and see. Uh, we think we have met Johnny the tailor. So we went to, to we had gone through and then we picked up his tracks on and what have you. And very soon we came up the place where four lions had sat down and eaten Johnny the tailor. Um, there was blood and guts everywhere. His, the Batonka normally didn't wear shoes, but this guy was sophisticated. He, he wore leather shoes. And the lions had eaten the entire body. The, what, what was left of him was the top of his skull from his eyebrows backwards. The middle part, all the bones and the brains and everything had been eaten. And that was lying like a, like a, like a dish, like a bowl on the side. His, his jaw bones were still there. The, the bracket of his front teeth is still there. His whole bottom jaw was still there, but it had been licked clean. It was a clean bone. The whole thing was clean. There were um, half a dozen bones, about 18 inches long, um, that had been stripped clean. Where there were two ribs that were stuck together with a little bit of tissue. Um, everything else of him was eaten, everything. There was no skin, no meat, no nothing. They'd even, even taken his shoes off and they had eaten the leather 
surface part of it and just left the rubber soles underneath. So we dug a hole that um, was about 15 inches long and about 10 inches wide and about a foot deep maybe. And we put the whole body inside there and covered it over. And that was Johnny the Taylor's grave. So everybody was very unhappy about this. A lot of crying and a lot of soul searching, etc. And we, we picked up the tracks from there. But re remembering that this had happened the previous day, it wasn't the same day. So we picked up the tracks. They walked right along the edge of the lake. Or the, the lake had been dropped a bit by then, but you fix a, a crack in the wall. Um, so there was a big dry area before the high water mark. We followed along the high water mark. We followed the tracks going west to the Sengwa River. I thought, well, they, won't go, they can't po possibly cross the Sengwa River. It was full of Kariba weed. They'd have drowned before they would have gone 20 meters. So, so um, I, I said, I said to, to, to Ben, I said, let's just follow the tracks. And if it gets there and they'll come back again, we may pick up today's spore on top of yesterday's spore. The easiest way to get to where today's spore is to follow yesterday's spore because we had no other indication where they'd gone. Mm. So we followed them for about five miles. Then we came across fresh tracks coming back. So we abandoned everything. We followed the fresh tracks coming back. And um, I think I had, I had two trackers with me that day. And um, we followed them back and then they came to one place. It went up a bit of a ridge, stony ridge into some thick bush, some um, um, jess there, very thick bush. And I know, knew that in there, there were backwaters from the Lake Kariba and they'd, they'd be in there somewhere. So it's just said stick to the tracks. And while we were talking about what we should do, this, there was a lioness and three cubs. The one cub was a female, the other two were males and the two males were bigger than their mothers. To give you some idea of what we were confronted, there were four four in that prime. Uh, the female, it started growling at us. So I, I stood I stood my ground and I just heard I could see where it was and I adjusted myself. He had a, a good sort of coming down to me. So it went, burst out of there coming down, it was coming like an express train. You, you don't know how fast a lion can run until you've experienced this. They, go, they literally run as fast as a racehorse. In fact, if they chased a racehorse, they'd catch it. And um, this thing came bo boiling out on its own. The lioness came on its own and it came down. As it was coming down, I smacked a bullet in, into its head and went through its head and threw its back into its body. And it just hit the ground and slid down the rest of the steep area towards me. And it stopped about 10 feet in front of me. And I reloaded. And then the, another young lion came, came rushing out, one of the young males, and it rushed out and it saw its mother lying dead. This is all within about 20, 30 yards of us, if not closer. And, um, and it stopped dead, took one look around and it turned to go. And as it turned, I slapped a bullet into its side behind its shoulder and it, it, it stumbled, but it ran up back into the jess and it was gone. So we ran after it and we, we, we couldn't see it. Is it you stick onto the tracks and put the trackers on the tracks and we follow. And then we heard splash, splash ahead of us. These lions had jumped off into one of these backwaters from Kariba <coughs> and it was floating weed all over the place. It, it was going through and we took off, we started running and then we passed the, the second lion I shot, it was lying dead on the tracks. We just ran past it and we got to the water and they were halfway through this and was two lions were swimming to get out on so the other side, it wasn't very far, it was about 20 meters away. And um, so I picked up the rifle to shoot and, and my tracker Ben said, oh, 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 of course, no, you mustn't shoot it now. So I said, why not? I can kill them easy. He said, yes, but then if you kill them now, they're gonna sink at the bottom and he want, they will then want me to go in and get them out the bottom of the river. And I said, this river's full, he said, this river's full of crocodiles. I'm not gonna do that. He said, wait till they get out the other side. So they, as they were pulling themselves out the other side, I shot them both and they both dropped dead on dry land and my trackers were happy with me for doing that. So um, that, that, that was um, the next incident of, of four lions on that occasion did that killing. So it was and, a lioness, uh, it was a lioness and, and, and youngsters? Yes, she had broken teeth. She was very old. Okay. But the, male, the male cubs were bigger than she was. Okay. Yeah. But she was the one that led them into doing all this. And I don't know, after three or four months of killing people, two people a week, uh, at least, I don't know. But as with the Batonko, they were primitive. They never reported these killings to anybody. They didn't go to the district commission and say, lions are killing us. If, 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 if Lady Joyce decided she wanted to go and visit Auntie, Auntie Mary across the way there, 
she would just say, okay, I'll see you. I'm going to see Mary. And she would walk out the village and she'd walk along the path to go to the next village. And on the way, she'd be eaten up by a lion. Nobody went to find her. They ate with four lions. They ate practically one human body is nothing for, for four lions to eat. So there's very little bone left. And whatever bone there was, there were enough hyenas around there, there to clean up the bones anyway. No, no bodies were found. But we know when we tried to tally all how many bodies have been killed, we, we couldn't get, get to the right number. Wow. Yeah, that's, that was my job. Okay, Ron, uh, another, another man-eating story. Another man-eating story. I was camped with my wife and my little boy then up on the, on the Chisarira Plateau, which is 2,000 feet above the valley. And uh, the Chisarira mountain range is about 2,000 feet high. Um, and it's about 60 miles. I'm now jumping from miles to kilometers, about 60 miles long. And there's only one entrance that goes up and that's up to set you into pass to get to the top. And we were camped on the top because we were blasting a new road up so that we could administratively start administering the game reserve. So um, while I was doing that, um, my family were up there with us. And there was a young, a young man um, called Ken Newton, something like, I think it was Newton. He was a, uh, a lieutenant in the, in the RAR, which was based in Bing at the time, and the war, the, the Rhodesian War had started then. And he was on a patrol and he was passing by us. So we said, why don't you come and come with your guys, your soldiers, come and spend the night with us up on the Chisarira and have supper with us, have a beer with us and have some supper with us, which he did. But on the way up, this road, windy road that climbed in four miles, it climbed 2,000 feet. On the way up, he came across a body. And... Uh, this was the body of a, of a, um, a Zipra soldier who was in, in, in Zipra army kit, had an AK-47 with him and his packs were all Russian packs and things like this. And, and what, had, what we discovered had happened was that he'd been caught up in a skirmish with the Rhodesian security forces. He'd been wounded and he went to a local mission and the mission station there looked after him and treated his wounds. And then he then said, thank you very much. And he walked out and he, he, he walked away. He wasn't going to be reported to, to as his presence there. So um, he then, I think, got a lift and to the bottom of the city went to pass, and the, which we were blasting up the road. And he walked up the road in the middle of the night. And he was sitting on a rock resting. He had bandages on him from, from where the missionaries had put the medicines on him. And... Um, he was just sitting there minding his own business with his AK-47 by his side, but he was, he was pretty badly hit. And um, the lions found him, four lions found him again. It was a female with three, with three big cubs. And, uh, and they killed him and they ate him in the middle of the road. So uh, Ken is coming up in his Land Rover with a, a, a big African soldier next to him, two soldiers on the back. And they, in the headlights, they see these lions just dispersing. And there they see the body and they see the... Uh, the bandages and everything, and then put two and two together immediately. So then he, Ken got out the vehicle and he picked up the AK-47, handed it at the back, so we're not leaving that here. And, uh, and then he took off up the road and he came to see us at the top. We had supper and everything laid out for him. And when he got back here, he told us about this. We had to postpone supper. And then we went, got in, 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 in my Land Rover and we went down the hill to where this had happened. I got out, examined the body, etc. We looked around and there, 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 there the lions were in front of us. So from, I was standing on the back and he and Ken was driving and I said, okay, stop, keep still everybody. And I shot the one lion through in the head at about 30 yards range and it dropped in the middle of the road. The others just scattered. And then we went down to that one and then we found, we saw one, we saw the eyes of one on the left. I shot that one. And then we turn another one, we're starting to move up the hill and I shot that one. And then the, the, the fourth one went right up to the base of the cliffs and it was away, way, way up the top there. It was far, far too far away, but it was there and I couldn't, I couldn't do anything other than I, had, I just had to have a go at it. So um, I, I took my time and uh, it was a long way away. It must've been 150 yards away and, and 45 degree angles away. And I, I shot him and I shot him in the head and it dropped and, um, Ken said to me, are we going to go up and look for it? No, I said, not in your bloody life. I'm not following any wounded lions out here, man-eating lions in the middle of the night. So let's go back and have supper. Let's have our beers. Let's have our whiskeys. Let's do what we're going to do. And we'll come around and see it tomorrow morning. And that's what we did. The next morning we came down, we picked up all four lions and we had them. And, uh, and we had the body of the guy, what was left of the body of the guy who'd been killed. So that's another one. How's that for you? 
What 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 raw food were you using? Nowadays, I see the hunters down here. They're always buying brand new rifles and the most expensive rifles. I'm in with the hunting communities in South Africa. They're helping me do my job, and that is to inform the public about about wildlife management issues. And uh, I get on well with the hunters. They're good people. And uh, I look at the rifles and you know, look at the magazines and they're all advertising new rifles and highfalutin ones and what have you. First of all, I didn't have the money in those days. I still don't have the money to buy those kind of rifles. I mean, they're costing thousands of rands. So I, I used to use, to begin with, when I first went to Wanky, um, there were a number of government firearms in the government armory. And uh, we all said, okay, you're going out to shoot a lion, stop killing lion, you better take the 458 with you or, or the 9.3 millimeter, which was Ted Davison's old rifle. That was still there. I used that quite often. But there was 375 Coggles and Harrison, there was a 416 Rigby and a whole lot of other highfalutin weapons like this. I hated the, the, the Rigby, first of all, because it kicked like a mule. And secondly, it, uh, it was so damned heavy. If I had to carry that all day long, I'd be dead by the time the sun set. So um, I took what I had, but the trouble when everybody uses weapons and they put them back, they're not properly looked after, even, even in national park establishments. So um, my parents came to visit me. Remember, I just turned 21. And um, my dad came out, I had to go and I was then shooting two buffalo every Friday for staff rations. Remember, Tim Brevig and I were the two dogs bodies there, had to do all these things. Not that I minded. So, uh, and we went out and um, we followed these tracks of these buffaloes. My old man had never hunted in his life before. He was a good Scotsman and, and a, good, a good man from the UK. Um, and he couldn't understand how it produced somebody like me. But anyway, he came along with us. And we were following these tracks. We got down, went down a slope like that. On the, on the other slope, on the other side, I could see these buffaloes lying up in, in, in the shade, getting out of the sun. And as I saw them, they saw me and they stood up. So I picked up this rifle. I was using a Cogswell and Harrison 375 Magnum and I pulled the trigger and I hit it in the shoulder and I broke the shoulder and this thing went down. All the other buffalo ran away. This one got up and charged me full bore. But now the bolt on my rifle had jammed solid. I couldn't open it. I was trying to kick it open with my heel. Um, and this buffalo is charging me from 50 yards away across the valley. So my Bushman tracker, um, Joyce, he got hold of it and he started kicking, kicking, and then he got it open. I opened the bolt, I put another round in and I shot this thing about 10 meters from me in front of me, bang, and put it down and, and that was it dead. My father came back to my mother and said, this son of ours isn't gonna last really long if he's having to use these rifles. <laughs> so my mother came to me and she says to me, you know, you were 21 last year, we didn't really give you a good birthday present. So we want to give you a rifle, <laughs> what do you want? So. That's how I got my rifle. And it was, what I got was a, a Browning um, um, 458 Magnum. It was a new caliber in the, in the field. Nobody in the country had, in the department had 458 Magnums. So I was a bit of a guinea pig at the time. And I, I used that, I've still got it with me now. I don't know how many rounds have gone through that barrel. Um, it's, it's almost worn out, but um, that's the weapon I use for everything. I even shot at one stage, I was out of food on horseback patrol, right in the middle of Wanky and I found a place where there were Egyptian geese, just the other side of a, of a damn wall. And I sneaked up and I shot an Egyptian goose through the head with my 458 Magnum. So I used it for everything, anything and everything. I always say, if, you, if you've got a rifle, it fits you, you know, how it, you know how it shoots, you're confident with it, don't change it. I, I, I took someone in the Karoo here. For three years, I acted as a, as a professional hunter, which is, it wasn't my, not something I wanted to do for, for a living. Um, I've never been a, prof, uh, a trophy hunter myself, never. Mm -hmm. But I have shot a lot of animals. Um, but this guy wanted to, he, he came with, with three or four different rifles. And some of them were firing um, bullet weights of twice the weight of the other one, the same caliber sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And when he fired all these on the range and everything, and we were going out hunting, I said to him, how do you work out where that bullet's going to fall? Because you fire this one on with a, a 300 grain and then a 350, then a 400 grain, mm -hmm. one with such a velocity, etc., etc. How do you know your rifles are all different? Your bullets are all different. How do you know where, where your bullet's going to go? He says, I know. He's an American. And he says, I know. 
I know exactly where my bullets are going to go and I'm going to show you. Well, I just could never understand that. If I had my one, if I had a 303, I'd probably have done better than he did. So 458 Magnum was my weapon of choice, although I did use a lot of other ones. And when I was doing um, a lot of elephant population reduction work, where you're shooting very high, high um, numbers of rounds in a very short space of time, um, I was using the, the British military self-loading rifle, the SLR, which is the same as the, as the, mm -hmm. the what the South Africans call the R1, mm -hmm. and, and, and shooting elephants with them, um, stone dead, or, or brain shots in a very short space of time. We never ever had any problems with them. And I think a lot of it is, if you're used to a weapon, and the weapon has got the, the penetration, so the bullet to hit the target which you're aiming at, any, any rifle is, is good enough. John, it's a, it's a terrible bloody question. You're probably sick and tired of being asked it, so don't answer if you don't want to, but people always ask about how many elephants have you, have you shot in your career? I don't know. You know, at, at one stage, in, in, actually, I, I, I could talk to you about it if you want. Um, in one of my books, um, I had a situation whereby um, a, a very well-known professional hunter from Namibia asked me that question. And I told him, I said, I don't know. I said, I, I never counted them. We, we, count, we sent in our reports. We had shot animals, etc. whatever it was, whatever we had done. And... Um, I, I said, I don't know, but if, if, you, if you ask me to guess, it would probably be about 5,000. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not worried about saying that because I was very good at what I did. Um, I was accused by this, this man, Gonjolves, in England when he wrote, he's, he runs an organization to stop trophy hunting. And he says, uh, he has recorded me as being the worst kind of, of uh, trophy hunter that imaginable. Nobody can be any worse than me as a trophy hunter. And how wrong can he be? Because I have never hunted a trophy in my life. Mm. Whatever I have killed, I have done so for management reasons and on government duty. Mm. And um, it's, it's all been legitimate. Mm. I mean, the, the, the exercise that we did in the, using the R1 rifles in the, in the Gona Rajor, I, I was commanded by my department to head a, a team a population reduction team to remove, reduce the elephants in the Ghana Rajor from 5,000 to 2,500. And, a half thousand. and um, I, had, I had no choice in the matter. The only choice where I did have, have a problem with was they also hired a helicopter for me to do it. I said, I don't want a helicopter. I said, we'll do it on foot. I can do it better than that. He said, oh, but the South Africans are using scoline and darts and things, and we want to, want to get up to date. And I said, that's not being up to date. We know how to kill elephants better than the South Africans do. They've got 8,000 elephants. We've got 140,000 elephants in Rhodesia. So uh, if they want to know how to shoot elephants, they can come and ask us, but I'm not doing what they're doing. And I think it's damn cruel to dart elephants with scoline, which is a paralyzing drug. Mm -hmm. And then half the time, you've got to go down, you dart them from a helicopter, then you've got to go down with a rifle and kill them with a bullet because they, mm. they're paralyzed, they can see you coming. And um, uh, mm. I think that's horrific, absolutely horrific. So mm. we did it that way. And I'll tell you how successful we were, just to give you some idea that, that we, we were 100% humane in this. We, we, I picked two other people and myself to go in and do the actual shooting. And we were shooting um, on average 41.6 elephants a day, every day. The biggest number we got in one day was 57. And we were taking out a herd of elephants of varying between 30 and, and 50 elephants in one herd. We were killing every single one of them with a single brain shot to the brain inside a period of 60 seconds. That's incredible. That what you incredible. Got to, we're shooting, we were shooting from almost point blank range. When we got the big cows down and we were in there, we were virtually touching the animals that we were killing in there towards the end. But we knew what we were doing. We weren't frightened. Mm. We, we weren't boasting. We were doing the job that we had to do. And mm. uh, we did it in the best way that we did do. And we, we took off those 2,500 elephants. And, and not one, not one was wounded and none got away from us. Every herd we tackled, we, we accounted for. That's quite incredible. I don't think uh, there are too many people around these days who could pull, pull that off because chaps just don't have that sort of experience, I suppose. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a question of, over the years, your confidence builds up mm. inside you. And it's if you're confident, 
if you know what your own capabilities are, it, it's not difficult. It's yeah. not difficult at all. And yeah. Lots of, lots of other, the other two, my other two colleagues with me, um, I selected them because I knew they were good hunters, hunters of elephants. They knew exactly where to put their bullets. They know how to do it. And what you must understand is if three of us went in with one of those military self-loading rifles, we had to use the British SLR yeah. because the department said the British SLR, unlike the, the South African R1, which is the same weapon, except the R1, you can fire it on fully automatic. Mm -hmm. The British SLR, you, you, the, the automatic thing had been sealed off. You couldn't, you couldn't do anything to make it fire two bullets with one pressure on the trigger. So um, we, we went in knowing that we could only shoot one, one pressure, one bullet, one pressure, one bullet, and, and that one bullet was one brain. So if, if, if you send three guys in, they've got a magazine, each with 20 rounds in the magazines, and you start shooting, you're shooting, he's shooting, and that guy's shooting. So three people are shooting. And you, 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 you complete the job in 60 seconds. We didn't always do it in 60 seconds, but we, we often did. Um, if, if you just, just think about it, I'm shooting, he's shooting, he's shooting. And in 60 seconds, and I've got 20 rounds in the magazine, I have got three seconds to pull off my 20 rounds. Th three seconds per bullet to fire off, that's within 60 seconds. So I can empty my, my magazine in 60 seconds. That guy empties his in 60 seconds, he does it in 60 seconds. So there you've got three rounds going out, three live rounds going out aimed, aimed at the brain in that length of time. And that's why you could do it like that. It's the only reason you could do it. And we all did it. We were all just, we were expert at what we did. We didn't relish what we did. We did it and we, mm. we, we, were, we weren't emotional about it. We didn't think about it. We went and we did and the job was done and it's finished. And mm. that's how it should be. And then we, we had big public meetings in, in, in Chirizzi, I remember, when, um, when the press got hold of us and the, the other hunters, the other um, sport hunters got, got in with us and said, why, why do you have to go and do the shooting? You could give it to us and we would pay you to do it. We'd take clients in to do it. I said, that isn't the job we were doing. We went in to do a job of work. And I said, half of the elephants were this size. They were, they were young animals. Would you get a client to shoot a young animal? No, we wouldn't shoot it. We'd shoot the big ones. I said, that's why you didn't do it. That's why we made sure you didn't do it. And you had to speak like this. You had to be open with them and tell them. I don't mind telling people what went on because it was exactly what we were supposed to do. And we were mm. extremely efficient in what we did. Yeah, I'm sure. Ron, um, changing the subject slightly, VIP hunts. Did you, were you involved in those taking the, not? Not once. No. And, not once. and just, uh, I just want to ask you a little bit about Sir Hugh, Hugh Beadle, the Chief Justice, because I remember him quite well. Him and my mom were, were great pals. They used to meet the cricket at the Curry or the Curry Cup games and always used to sit together. He, he was very fond of my mom and my mom was very fond of him. But a very interesting guy with an interesting war record, a brilliant lawyer, and um, a great a great elephant hunter. And a connoisseur. Was he? <laughs> yes. There's, there's stories. He used to regularly go and shoot in, in the Chilocho forests, which is south of Wanky. He'd take a license, legal, everything was legal, always. Um, and he, but the way he went, he went about everything was, was quite funny. He, um, and the Bushmen tell you about him. The Bushmen, well, well, the trackers and the people living down in that area will tell you about him. There's one great story about him where he, um, he went in to shoot this elephant and it, it had a go at him and he shot it and it fell down, but he didn't kill it. But it fell down and it knocked him over and it, it, lay, it fell on top of his rifle. And, that, and he was, the story was saying, all the, all the black guys, they still laugh about it to this day. Um, they say the old man was standing there. He had the butt of his rifle in his hand and he was kicking this elephant and screaming at him, get off his bloody rifle. <laughs> he couldn't shoot it because the elephant was lying on his rifle. He couldn't put it in a, a, a coup de, in the bra at all. But he was a grand old man. I, I loved him dearly. And you know he was he was dignified and everything, and he was such a high powered person in the country, mm. and he had no compunction about stopping in the middle of the road and saying, "Hi, Ron, how are you? How are they going? How yeah. many elephants?" <laughs> no, always elephants, always about elephants. Yeah, wonderful black, and he had a he had a very 
soft spot for Wanky, didn't he? I mean, he spent a lot of time there. He liked to go down yes. there and be with you guys. Yes, he was. That's correct. Ron? Yeah. Man, thanks for your time. Um, I hope we can carry on and do, do another one.